fucking door. What? Lock the fucking door. Move it. All right, all right, all right. right. Move it. Right. Get your fucking hands on there. Get fucking right. back. Right, where's the fucking money? What? Where's the fucking money? Move it! Get your fucking ah! hands in! What the fuck is it? That's, that's all there is! Please! Just take the money. Charles Bronson, Britain's most violent man. 36 years in prison, 200 acts of violence in four years, 32 years in solitary confinement, serial hostage taker, inmate of virtually every prison in Britain. Barely sane psychopath, or much abused victim of a poorly governed and vindictive prison culture. The legend all began with the theft of 26 pounds stolen during that clumsy post office raid on Merseyside. I fear no one. Violence just makes me madder and stronger. I'm king of the roofs, master of sieges, supreme lord of cuttings and stabbings, Darth Vader of destruction, stylist of attempted murders, and governor of isolation. Who can beat that? The Supreme Lord of Cuttings and Stabbings began life as Michael Peterson. Born to Joe and Ira Peterson, Michael's early happy boyhood was spent growing up in Luton, Bedfordshire. Well, I had uh, two sons, uh, John and Michael, which is known as Charlie now. And they were perfect children. Everybody used to say what lovely children they were. Could take them anywhere. And... Uh, and then Mark came along eight years later. And then we had a great family life. Uh, the father, uh, Joe, was very strict with the boys. I used to think he was a bit too strict. But they were three lovely children and they loved one another. Uh, everything was happy. Younger brother Mark also has good memories of growing up. He was just a good brother to me. I looked up to him as I looked up to John. Um, they were always well behaved. I mean, mum, you know, people used to come up to my mum in the street and say, uh, you know, your three lads always look well, well turned out and very polite and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, we were a good, happy family. I remember very little happened until about the age of eight. But I know mum and dad did everything they could to make our lives happy. We weren't rich, but the house was spotless. And me and John always wore dicky boats to school. John and I went to the same schools. He was okay, but I hated it. We were so different in so many ways. He was easy come, easy go. I was more introverted. I had a great fear of the dark and couldn't control my bladder until I was 10. When he was at school in Luton, he was um, a very shy person. Uh, very cool. He wasn't, uh, no, wasn't a naughty child. He never answered you back. The only thing he didn't like is if he was told off in front of anybody. He hated that. But um, he, he had a few scraps at school and he had a couple of different schools. When he was eight years old, Michael Peterson was accidentally hit on the head by his mother in a domestic accident caused as the youngster played around dangerously close to his mother as she was preparing tea. Come on, tea is nearly ready. I'm just about to... All right, I just want you to sit down. Michael, for heaven's sake! Oh, Michael! Oh, I'm so sorry. It would have been a traumatic experience for such a close-knit and loving family. Now, having an accident with a ketchup bottle at the age of nine could be an unpleasant head injury, but I doubt it would have anything to do with later difficulties. But it is indisputable that young Michael's behaviour began to take a marked departure from the norm. One day, something strange came over me. Maybe this was the start of my fucked up life, who knows. 
I hung around by a big tree near my home. I had an empty bottle in my hand, a milk bottle. I was ready to bash anyone that came past, but no one came. I was 13, and I had my first urge to kill. It's very interesting to think about what might have been the triggers for that first um, episode where he attacked himself with a bottle. He was on his own waiting for his mates. They didn't turn up. Did he feel humiliated? Did he feel rejected? Um, and very often, in my experience, in working with men who have problems with violence, triggers to violence are um, is anything that makes them feel that they've been put down made to feel vulnerable, made to feel needy. He's 13, he's in puberty, and what he finds is that a good solution for feeling bad is violence. I know he was, he was expelled. I, I've got a feeling, uh, I wouldn't like to say it's true, positive, but I think he had to teach her. And then my mother and father moved to Ellesmere Port. My father was sent up from Vauxhalls, and he missed his grandparents a lot he was very good to his grandparents so he said to me one day he said I think I'm going to go and move up to Ellesmere Port mum with Nan oh I said you better find out first if she'll have you like you know and then he met his future wife she got pregnant I, I like the girl she come from a good home money people, you know? I suppose every now and then he used to go out, you know, go on a bender like, with his mates and stuff like that, and uh, maybe that's when things started to go wrong for him, you know, got him with the wrong crowd. One thing Michael was showing promise at was boxing. Both his father Joe and his uncle Jack were both involved in the boxing scene. He used to go to the Phoenix Club because his father was a trainer. My dad was ex-Royal Navy and um, he boxed for the Navy. He was, he was quite tasty in his day and uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's from my dad's side of things, you know, got, got him interested. Uh, Uncle Jack Cronin, he was a Londoner and he loved Charlie and Charlie was always around this flat because Charlie was introduced to so many boxers which, you know, he loved. It was here that Peterson also met leading boxing promoter Paul Edmonds, friend of the craze and provider of bare-knuckle fighters for illegal backstreet bouts. It was Edmonds who actually gave Michael Peterson his new name. He chose my name. I don't think I've ever seen a Charles Bronson film. Contrary to popular belief, I don't hero worship him. I actually wanted to be called Jack Palance after the great actor who, in his early days, won prize money as a boxer. Charlie had his first unlicensed fight, he fought the Bermondsey Bomber, who was a savage man. And he landed the first blow onto Charlie and it was a kick into the balls. So he dragged that fight into the gutter. It was a very savage fight. But for his first fight into the unlicensed game, it was to show you what was to come. You know, Charlie was, was suited to the fight game. He was a savage man. Price fighting is to be money involved. Oi! Oi! Where's my fucking money? Oi! Oi! Charlie! Where the fuck you going? Charlie, the police! I was protecting fuck our money, police. Charlie! Give me my fucking money! Charlie, calm down, calm down! That's my fucking money! Calm down, Charlie. I wouldn't rob you, Charlie. We've been friends years. Fuck off! I want my money! Charlie, you didn't finish the I fight. I'm Charlie, right fucking hiding man there for you. Can't pay for half a fight, fucking Charlie. Fucking, you see you, I'm gonna fucking rip you apart, man. Charlie, calm down. Give me my fucking money! Charlie, there's no need for that. The fuck off, you mug. Fucking asshole. Michael Peterson had enjoyed a happy childhood, but his adolescence had been increasingly clouded by delinquency, self-harm, and criminal damage. He was now on the threshold of adulthood and was about to enter a vortex of violence of barely credible proportions. The most violent man in Britain 
was about to cut loose. Peekaboo! Luton schoolboy Michael Peterson started displaying early symptoms of violence. His youthful aggression was channeled into boxing. But within a couple of years, he had become a prolific youth offender, leading up to armed robbery to become Britain's longest serving prisoner, Charles Bronson. By the time he was 15, Peterson was beginning to commit serious criminal damage. He was first remanded to Risley in 1968, where he was psychiatrically assessed. Upon his release in 1969, he and some friends stole a lorry load of furniture. A smash and grab raid saw him in the dock at Chester Crown Court again in 1971. Incredibly, Bronson was about to get the biggest break of his short, violent life so far. There can be no doubt whatsoever that another custodial sentence is the correct and prescribed punishment in this case. However, it seems to me that there are certain elements to your existence which may point, for once, to a different course of action in dealing with you. You have a loving and supportive wife, and a young son to whom you are obviously devoted, and you had a reasonably secure income as a painter and decorator which you managed to hold down. Therefore, I will not, in the first instance, add to the 18 months you have already served in youth jail. Peterson, listen to me most carefully. I am offering you a chance, probably the last one you will ever get. Be in no doubt. If you waste it, I suspect you will also waste your whole life. Do not do so. I sentence you to three years in prison. Suspended for three years. I'd just been given my big break by a judge and now I was about to blow it. I felt unsettled, unhappy at home. I was going out clubbing, meeting villains, but there was no real excuse. I was 21 now. It should have been time to put childish ways behind me. Don't ask me why, but I went out and I got a shotgun. And I sawed the barrel off. This was a very serious escalation of his crimes. Clearly, Bronson was now running wild. But why did he do it? Bronson himself claimed that the death of his beloved grandfather around this time had much to do with it. I got to know Bronson in the early 1990s when I was working as a governor at Wood Hill Prison in Milton Keynes. Most people talk about Bronson the prisoner, but very few people talk about Bronson the offender. And frankly, whilst Bronson has become almost a professional prisoner, I think what people are less aware of is that he wasn't a very successful offender. Bronson had 18 months experience of juvenile prisons, but nothing could have prepared him for the shock of arriving at Walton Prison for a seven year stretch in 1974. As he himself wrote about it, the gates of my personal hell were opening. Bronson was put in H-Wing, the section of the old dilapidated Victorian prison reserved for long-termers. His cell measured 12 by 8 by 12 feet. He was surrounded by old lags who had been there for 30 years or more. He feared he would never see his loved ones again. He wrote later that Walton was a living hell, infested with rats and cockroaches. Visits from his family became impossible for him to bear. Walton was a dangerous tipping point for Bronson. After one particularly painful visit from his wife and baby son, he broke a prisoner's nose and attacked another so violently that he almost gouged the man's eyes out. Bronson was now beginning to be talked about. In HMP Hull in 1975, the authorities assigned him to the sewing room. Bronson trashed the place. In HMP Armley, Bronson began his extreme fitness training, which continues to this day. He also attacked a grass, beating him senseless. In every prison, he stole needles, nails, shards of glass, wire. Anything which could cause injury, and used them constantly. 
In the special unit at HMP Parkhurst in 1976, he attacked a fellow prisoner, Johnny O'Rourke, and smashed a broken jam jar straight in O'Rourke's face. Bronson landed another 20 or so blows with the jagged glass until he was pulled off by prison staff. Bronson's infamy was now leaking out to the press. These savage and bloody attacks were now appearing on tabloid front pages with increasing frequency. Bronson, the story, was born. He loves the attention, the media loves him. He, he's a story, an ongoing story, one of those stories that never go away. And people love that about crime stories. They love it about criminals who are inside prison. They want to follow their lives. It gives the public something to latch onto, and I think gives Bronson something to latch onto in his own life. It's a curious relationship. Catch-22, does the media start it and he respond? Does he, does he kick it off? And, and the media then follow what he does. It, it's a mixture of both. Many in the country were, of course, shocked by reports of such brutal attacks. But around this time, he also started receiving fan mail, mostly female, in prison. Bronson is a combination of both bad and has underlying uh, psychological problems. In particular, I would suggest that he's a classic cluster B personality type, by which I mean he's paranoid, he's narcissistic, uh, he's prone to exaggerated reactions, he sees events in black and white, and he's quite histrionic when things don't go his way. Oi! Lunch! Well, the one thing that is an absolute certainty about Charles Bronson is that there are no certainties. He may well go in his own little world, in his own mind, uh, he may go months uh, where he acts in a fairly normal way and then you will get outburst after outburst after outburst. It's all down to him and what, how he wants to play his game. Controlling Charles Bronson when he does get out of control is a real issue. How do you deal with that? Yes, there is control and restraint systems in place. What is a normal reaction is very hard to tell. Yes, Bronson has misbehaved and committed acts of violence which need to be dealt with by the courts. He's a very strong man. He's one of the strongest men probably in the prison system, even at his age now. But restraining him in such a violent way, which obviously takes away an element of his dignity, I, th I think is something that he reacts badly to. And, and he almost seems to want to bring it on. It almost as if he wants to suffer a degree of physical pain, which can't be good for him and it can't be good for the prison officers involved. In only his second year in an adult prison, Bronson announced his arrival in the community in yet another brutal and senseless crime. Uh, the way in which you treat people that may injure other prisoners in that way is to put them in a very controlled regime, a very controlled environment, and if necessary, make sure that they are not able to injure other prisoners until he proves to people and until he can be trusted uh, to behave in a rational and proper way, uh, I think that that is the environment that this person demands uh, from the prison service. Bronson's violent attacks in prison spiralled out of control. He had been caged, now he was to be restrained as well. Brian Cato describes this controversial technique. It's based on delivering elements of pain to subdue the violent behaviour, and it, in most cases uh, it works very, very well uh, uh, without delivering any long-lasting uh, breaks or muscular damage. It is about putting pressure on, on the wrist and applying pressure across in either a passive way where pain is not delivered but knowing that, and the prisoner would know and so would you, um, that, that when you apply pressure that way then pain is delivered. I have been controlled and restrained myself in a few prisons. I've never seen it happen to Charlie because he's always been in solitary which is the worst place to be because no one else can actually see what they're doing to you as well. I think any time any of these um, restraint incidents happen, I think they uh, go in as heavy-handed as they can. It's sort of like payback for their colleagues, in my opinion. 
Prisoners frequently are the subject of force by prison officers. Uh, the level of force varies, but the nature of the prison regime means that force is often used on prisoners. The issue that then arises is whether that force is reasonable, uh, whether it is proportionate to the justification. If people do get hit, uh, that's not part of the process, although I have to say, uh, in order to get locks on, sometimes uh, force is, it has to be used and, and there is no other way around it. And of course a prison officer is taught to use all necessary force in order to subdue prisoners. I've been to prisons to visit him and they won't let me in. And I say, well, I'm not going home all the way back to Chester from here until I see him. And then they've decided to let me in and he'd been hurt, split lips, black eyes, things like that. It was now late 1978. In the previous four years, Michael Peterson had been incarcerated in 10 British prisons. He was only 26. Ahead of him lay another 33 years in prison, 123 further prison transfers, three declarations of insanity, and 90 precious days of freedom. Where's the fucking money moving? A bungled robbery in 1974 had landed Charles Bronson in one of Britain's most notorious jails, Walton Prison, Liverpool, on a seven-year stretch. As more and more of his bloody exploits were coming to the attention of the public, he was being increasingly labelled the most violent man in Britain. Scratch! Your nose looks like it's broken or something. You look a mess. It was the screws. The screws did it so many. No, they didn't. You did this on your own. This is your own fault. You've got to stop fighting. I can't cope outside. Not on my own. With him. The thing about Bronson that people don't quite realise is that he doesn't want to be ordinary. He doesn't want to be normal. You've got to stop fighting, otherwise you're going to end up in a nut house. He wants to be extraordinary. And therefore, he's learned over a long period of time that the way he can draw attention to himself, the way he can keep his narcissism happy, the way he can keep driving himself to the centre of the stage is to fight uh, with staff, is to complain, is to take hostages, is to maintain a very public persona about who he is and why he's behaving as he does. And one of the things I think that we mustn't lose sight of is that Bronson has actually been very adept at manipulating the public perception of him and what it is that he does so that people want to see him as a kind of poster boy for surely this man can be rehabilitated as opposed to the fact that Bronson doesn't want to be rehabilitated. Charlie, I'm, I'm sorry. You just got piss on my shoe. I didn't mean to, mate. I, I'll get it. Nice, all right. They're only prison shoes. They're shy anyway. I tell the very, very first time that we nearly laid eyes on each other, I was in the special unit at Belmarsh, and he was in the hole at the bottom, at the, like the solitary. And um, I think it was about three o'clock in the morning, and I heard, Courtney. And I thought... I'm going to try and do the best South London gangster bit again. I was thinking, please let that be a dream. Please let that be a dream. And, Courtney, you cocky little bastard. And I'm thinking to myself, right, I did hear that. The only chance I've got is there might be someone else in here called Courtney. That is the only chance I've got. He went, listen, you little skinhead. He goes, I'm going to bite an hole in your chest and suck the life out of you. I was like... And people tell you not to be frightened of words, but when you hear that, it, and it just sounded like it came from hell, and I was like, in my best South London gangster voice, I got to the window, and everyone else was listening, and went like, Johnny? <laughs> Johnny? Oh, don't. You know? And uh, grovelled like, um, like, like you would. And there could be no Bronson's original seven-year sentence was now being extended over and over again because of terrible crimes against fellow inmates and prison staff alike, including wounding with intent, criminal damage, grievous bodily harm, false imprisonment, blackmail and threatening to kill. He has currently served 36 years inside and because of this pattern of violence, 
has served all but about four years in solitary confinement. There's no one more qualified than Charles Bronson to talk about the prison system because he's been in 120 or more prisons. He's been in solitary confinement for most of his years. And you have to say for yourself, how is that going to help him? How moving prison here and there, often in the middle of the night, how is that going to help him feel more secure and at peace with himself and at peace with the system? Solitary confinement is used both as a punishment but also to segregate prisoners from other prisoners because they are a threat to good order and discipline. Now, if you have a prisoner who is constantly getting into fights, either with other prisoners or with members of staff, somebody who's taking hostages, for example, then a governor in that position is left with no other option but to segregate that prisoner into solitary confinement. He's done more than enough time in solitary confinement. You know, in my opinion, he should be back in a normal wing. Uh, there was an incident uh, many years ago where while he was in solitary. Uh, he wasn't let out for his food. His food was passed through like a cat flap in the door, if you like. And he went to eat the food and uh, someone had urinated in it, which is a disgusting thing to do. So the next person who went come through that door, he, he, he knocked him out, as I, any, any man would, wouldn't they? <gasps> 32 years in solitary confinement is tragic. I was thinking about that and thinking, what could that be about? And perhaps, in a way, the message that Charles Bronson is giving is like that he can't live with others. That, again, he, he needs to be in a place where he can be totally externally managed and contained. That he can't manage interpersonal relationships of any intimacy, that they're too overwhelming. And so that the solitary confinement, although awful, is also perhaps better at, at some level for him than having to manage with people. It should be exceptional for a prisoner to be held as long as he has been held for an offence of robbery or, or an offence of that nature. And in those circumstances, although the state may, in very limited circumstances, be able to justify continued detention, it's absolutely critical, it seems to me, that there is a very, very careful review of that justification. There you go, scumbag. Even your missus don't want you. This was, in all probability, the final straw for Bronson the dreadful final confirmation of everything he had been half expecting for some time. Proof positive to him that his personal degeneration had now hit rock bottom. He had lost everything. Oh, it was a smack in the face that I never recovered from. I cried my fucking eyes out that night in my own emptiness, under a stinking blanket. I'd throw my whole life away. The woman I loved and the son I worshipped. I knew from that night that my life would never be normal. I'd lost everything, including my sanity. I could hear Irene's voice in my head. You'll end up in the nut house. You're going to end up in the nut house, do you know that? I was beginning to believe her. Those charged with the care of Bronson's mental health now became seriously worried. The issue of whether Mr Bronson is insane is probably not the correct issue to consider. Insanity is a defence in criminal law, uh, but is a relatively restricted defence. The issue that would be probably more relevant is whether he could be detained under the Mental Health Act. Under the Mental Health Act, somebody can be detained if they need to be detained in hospital for their own welfare, essentially. Now, oh. Charlie, as you know, you've got your parole coming up shortly, and they will be asking questions about your past misdemeanors. How do you feel about that? I just had this thing about head shrinks. Basically, I never fucking liked them. Is there anything you want to talk about?
Oh, oh, oh. Hmm. oh the teeth seem to be there. No broken bones. You want to learn to behave yourself, Sonny. Or you could be in for regular kicking. And some more doses of this. The liquid course? It's another method of restrain and subdue. Yeah? And the stronger Charlie got, physically, uh, the more harder I should imagine it was for them to restrain him with you holding arm. Well, that arm was like that by then, you know, you just hold his head with his necks like that. So it became a lot easier to use the liquid kosh. I didn't have to start smashing him around the head, and that's what they mean, kosh. Restrain shouldn't be with a kosh smashing him. Restrain should be holding him down, restraining him. The term liquid kosh is a, an old-fashioned one now, and it used to be used about a particular drug, which was Largactyl or Chlorpromazine, which is an antipsychotic medication, basically what's called a major tranquilizer, which um, would be used at times to try and manage people who were behaviorally disturbed. The difficulty about um, Largactyl or Chlorpromazine is that it has quite a lot of side effects and in many ways is not going to be effective unless the person is really suffering from psychosis or a mental illness, in which case it could help with that. And uh, unfortunately at times it was used in prison settings to basically subdue prisoners. I am aware that prisoners complain that liquid coshes are used to control their behaviour. It appears to me, however, that they are used less frequently than is alleged, probably. Uh, and the reason for that is that, as far as I'm aware, there is no legal basis for them, save in very limited circumstances where the prisoner doesn't have capacity to consent to medical treatment and it is medically necessary. It was used because people were registered under the Mental Health Act and therefore they could give medication without the consent of the individual concerned. It was used a lot whilst a vacancy became available in the high security hospitals in Broadmoor, Rampton, uh, Carstairs in Scotland and uh, Moss Side and Park Lane as there were Ashworth Hospital now. We went to Parkhurst and to visit him there and we, he was sitting around a table and he said, see them two over there, Mum? He said, they're the Cray twins. I said, oh, yeah. He said, I've asked if it's, you can meet them. Anyway, they were very good to Michael, to Charlie. And I think it was Ronnie that went to Broadmoor. And they, they, said to, they did say to Charlie, do something now, plead as though you're insane. And go to, uh, you get, go to Broadmoor. Broadmoor because it's run different because it's a hospital. In 1978, after serving separate terms of imprisonment in 29 different prison cells, the prison service finally gave up on Bronson. He had committed over 200 different acts of violence in four years. The state had now decided that Bronson was mad. Charles Bronson's ultra-violent and turbulent life had ensured that the ex-bare-knuckle fighter and teenage petty criminal had now become the most infamous adult prisoner in Britain. Divorce from his wife and separation from his beloved son had catapulted him into the dark and sinister place he feared most. Broadmoor Hospital. From the moment the gates opened, I could smell the madness. The place was full of despair, full of souls who were lost. For the first time in my life, I felt fear. A fear that I would never be free again. There was no future that I could see for myself. All I felt was a big black hole. There is no such clinical diagnosis as insanity. Um, 
what I think probably happened is that he was uh, transferred from prison to a special hospital on the grounds of personality disorder, not necessarily mental illness. Insanity refers to what we would colloquially think of as madness. The symptoms perhaps associated with schizophrenia, hearing voices, having delusions, um, fragmentation of the personality. That, from what I've seen, doesn't ever seem to have been described with Charles Bronson. That the populations of our special hospitals or the maximum secure hospitals had several groups in them. One was a mental illness group, people with schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, but also uh, people with a diagnosis of personality disorder, usually antisocial, uh, with other personality disorders alongside, such as narcissistic. And I would guess that um, Charles Bronson was seen as somebody who suffered from personality disorder or colloquially known perhaps as psychopathic. The next day we went and I said to Michael, is that true? Once you're in here, you, you'll never get out. So he said, well, it is isn't. It is really like that, Mum. He said, you've got to be assessed and whatnot and you've got to have a certificate to say, you know, but he had a bit of a, a time in there. They used to put him on this table with the, all the electric wires. He used to jump off the bed and that. He's had injection. I saw him one month and he looked good. I went to see him a few weeks later and he was blown up as though somebody had pumped him up. He must have gone up to about 19 stone. Well, I... There to help you, to make you feel better. Nah. I do drugs, never have, never will. Well, you only have to take two a day. Oh, is that right? Well, why don't you take them out that door and stick them where the sun don't shine? I took these drugs and my hell began. These liquid medicines Wait. were antipsychotic drugs Fucking with bad side effects. I felt as though my whole nervous system was breaking down. Ah! It caused muscular spasms so bad that I collapsed on the floor. My tongue seemed to double in size. I had no saliva. The pain in my spine was agony. This was way beyond any pain I'd known. It terrified me. I was twisted up like a cripple. They can have um, significant side effects, and one of them is that your uh, tongue can feel uh, quite swollen and it tends to writhe. You can get a tremor in your legs. Headaches, not so common. Um, often it was over-drooling rather than dryness, but... As far as I'm aware, there is no basis in law for uh, the administration of medication to a prisoner without their consent, save in very limited circumstances. Those circumstances essentially are where uh, medication is necessary for uh, the patient's health and that patient is, lacks the capacity to consent. Such drugs would not have made much impact on his internal world, on his mind. They might have subdued him, but they probably wouldn't have addressed his major difficulty. I've spoke to him a few times when he's going, they're hurting me, Dave. Dave, they're hurting me in my head, they're hurting me in my veins. You know, and, and, like, and you actually want to generally cry for him because, and I know, I know he's telling the truth because another day he go, fuck him, I listen, I listen, he won't even stand beside me on the phone, fuck him, and all that, you know, but the next day it's like, hey, they are hurting me, you know, I'm, all my, all my veins are burning, I'm all burning, they've done something to me. It was inhuman, it hurt me badly, I felt bitter and hateful, but I knew in my heart of hearts that I would get my own back. We had um, a, a, a particular military expression that goes back to Roman times called dominate the high ground. Uh, Bronson's not on his own. Many prisoners have taken to roofs to demonstrate, etc. And it does get you above the prison wall and in public view. And of course, that way you build up your reputation. 
In the early 80s, when uh, when Michael was in Broadmoor, um, he managed to get on the roof and he'd been up there for the best part of a week and they, they couldn't get him down. So uh, I was in the Royal Navy at the time and I got compassionate leave. I met my father there and after a couple of hours, we managed to talk him down off the roof. And uh, one of the conditions were, you know, he could have a visit with, with me and Dad. So the, the, they kept their word. He got down there, uh, we had the visit, but we found out later that um, he was beaten black and blue and put into hospital after that incident. One of the most reported aspects of Charles Bronson's behaviour in prison, and one which sets him apart from most other violent inmates and would-be escapers, is his hostage-taking. <laughs> Few ever attempt it. It is virtually impossible to set in motion. And the consequences for the perpetrator when the siege is over are dire. Bronson has achieved it three times. The sheer terror and mayhem such an occurrence creates ensured Bronson even more column inches. By any standards, this was extreme behavior on the very edge of sanity and has done much to perpetuate the Bronson story. Uh, to take someone against their will, to hold them against their will, to make the kind of threats that are made, uh, I don't think should ever be taken lightly. I think many people do take it lightly. Do ya? It's damaging beyond belief. People are so, so uh, badly damaged that they will never live a normal life again. One area of Bronson's rehabilitation that seems to have met with some success is art. Bronson has had a prolific output over the last 30 years. Uh, he loves his art. It started by um, a prison officer um, back in the late 70s, early 80s, and uh, he took some pens and paper into, into Michael's cell and said, uh, see what you can do with, the, with them, Charlie. He says, what are you on about? He says, well, draw us a picture. He says, well, I'm no artist. And he said, well, let's prove it. Let's see what you can do. And that basically that's how it started. And because he spends all the time in solitary, he's, uh, over the years he's got better and better. And his art now it makes big money. He, he, um, I, I look after his art and stuff. And uh, when he, when he tell, you know in, when he asks me to, I send it to different charities and stuff. It gets all you know auctioned at charities, and he makes thousands of pounds for charity. Although Bronson has undoubtedly been much quieter in recent years, the story continues, and he has been disciplined for allegedly attacking prison staff. Bronson was able to cover himself in butter and margarine and become literally too slippery to restrain. As a result, he fears that freedom may yet again be denied him. Personally, I find the idea that somebody should never be released uh, objectionable because I think it takes away uh, both the individual's uh, hope for a brighter future and because uh, the system, it seems to me, must always believe that it's capable of rehabilitating people. Would I like him living next door to me? Uh, the answer to that uh, with Charles Bronson is no, thank you very much, and neither would I want him. At least in prison, um, people in prison, the prison officers, staff, um, the governors, uh, the medical staff and prisoners uh, know who he is and they know in the main what he's capable of doing. There will continually be a campaign to get Charlie out for the next considerable amount of years, I think. But there is not a nice ending to this story, no. It does end in tears. Unless he can set himself free from the prison cell in his mind, I do not see how he could ever be set free from the prison cell that surrounds him. I think that man has suffered enough. Please, God, and I mean this sincerely, please, God, he gets some form of happiness in his life even if it is only for the last third of his life. No, I think he should be put in somewhere now where he's starting mixing, learning about money, learning about life outside, which nobody seems to be doing. When he does get released, uh, he's going to come and live with me for a while, and uh, you know I aim to help him rehabilitate. He's never used a computer, mobile phone, anything like that. Psychologically, this is a paranoid, narcissist who wants to be famous and that's what drives Charles Bronson. He can't achieve those goals in the community, he can only achieve those goals within the institution of prison. Charles Bronson himself reviews the whole tragic situation and his own seemingly endless predicament. to the past.
public. That price out there are very, very minimal. Not dangerous, this is inside, not outside. I could be released tomorrow. I'm making a nice little living out of my heart. That winds me up. It's people like the Yorkshire River. And they've got the human rights barristers and QCs. What about Charlie Dodson's human rights? Hey, 36 years in the camp. 21 when I come in. I'm 58 now. I've only been home three months in all that time. Do me a favour. What about my human rights? It's about time people woke up and smelled the shit. Australia's backpacker murderer claimed seven lives and it took detectives three years to catch him. We follow the case next tonight in brand new Murder Trail.